So today we'll talk about MLOps best practices in the LLM area. And my name is Daliana. I'm a senior data scientist at PrediBase. And today we have a very special guest, Mikiko Basley. Uh, she is the head of MLOps at FeatureForm. Previously, she was a senior software engineer working on MLOps at Intuit. She's passionate about demystifying MLOps and show how to develop high quality ML product from scratch. Uh, you can find her content on LinkedIn and YouTube. Today we'll talk about uh, MLOps best practices, common mistakes, especially how to do MLOps right for large language models. And later we'll give a demo of how to uh, fine tune your own LLM in PrediBase, and then we'll have a Q&A with Mikiko. So if you have any questions, you can uh, type in, in the chat. We might not be able to answer all the questions during our um, live talk, but we'll address them at the end of the session. And if you are registered, I mean, you're already here, you also um, have access to the uh, recordings. Okay, let's get started. So, Mikiko, um, I think you were muted. Yeah, I'm, I'm on. I didn't want people yeah. to hear me like drinking my coffee in the background. <laughs> <laughs> if you're drinking our coffee, cheers. Uh, so before we uh, talk about best practices, I mean, I introduce uh, you a little bit. Do you want to also tell us your experiences, maybe a few uh key project you worked on some model you have deployed yeah absolutely so um i think you did a great job um covering the my, my background but maybe i guess a few other interesting points for folks so uh, i joined so i joined uh feature form which is an open source uh feature store company um in october of last year I had joined them from uh, MailChimp slash Intuit, where I was on the ML platform team. Uh, I joined MailChimp originally, and then that was purchased by Intuit and all that. So um, MailChimp is, well, has been an email marketing company for at least 20 years. They have expanded into like other areas, including e-commerce and stores. Um, but you know, a lot of the stuff that, because it's an email marketing company, like NLP projects were like, the almost like the de facto uh you know use case right and i think machine i think mailchimp was kind of the first place where i really got exposed to the idea of uh you know generative ai for language and text and specifically like the introduction of llms in business use cases that could actually drive like value it was the first time i'd kind of like been exposed to that um, you know, and one of the projects we, and there was a couple things that had been going on. So at that point, I think, uh, OpenAI had released like GPT-3. And so we had done an ha a hackathon internally at MailChimp, um, to try out kind of different use cases and MailChimp, you know, their main customer base is small, medium sized businesses. So the whole premise is through this, uh, pr product and set of features called Crave Assistant. The idea is that if you are, you know, a one to 10 person mom and pop shop, um, a lot of times you don't always have the financial resources to go hire like a full-time marketer, a full-time copywriter, a full-time, uh, you know, email expert. A lot of times what you really need is you need help with just transactional emails, like letting people know, hey, there's a holiday sale going up, all that. So essentially a lot of times businesses need to create all these different kind of variations. They need to make sure the branding is in line with their, uh, with the brand palette, with the stock images, with, uh, even like the tone of writing. And so there are a number of models like in that area, even before, you know, OpenAI came out with a GPT-3 that were already kind of supporting that use case. Uh, for example, um, I believe test, I mean, I think I, Pretty sure we had like a testing like email headlines that wasn't an nlp model but there are others for example like how to identify tone how to identify uh persona and there's like a few other traits and those would be wrapped into like a, a multimodal uh pipeline or system right which eventually 
uh, through a lot of like that hackathon, a lot of the different teams, including my own team, we looked at it and go, okay, w- g- given that we have this early access to like, or not early access, it wasn't really early access to GPT-3, but we have access to GPT-3. Um, how can we kind of use that into a way where, for example, we had all this information on um, intents or tone or things like that. How can we then somehow kind of wrap it up into an actual product? And so we didn't realize at the time, but that in many ways was almost setting the foundation for a pattern that is being used now called uh, RAG, which is retrieval augmented. Um, I forgot what the last word is, but essentially it's a way that some companies are using to uh, take existing LMs and to um, provide additional or to augment it with external data sources to make like the prompts um, and also the, you know, the outputs from those prompts, um, the responses a lot more specific and a lot more um, up to date and relevant. Right. So that Mm -hmm. was one project to me that was like really kind of super interesting was the actual hackery and tinkering of that part of the project normally it would have been very very hard to do like when i was going through um so you know and we've talked about this on like one of your previous podcast episodes but for people who like in the audience who maybe um haven't heard that episode before we had talked about how i had transitioned to data science through a boot camp this was really springboards data science boot camp track um mm-hmm. and at that time you know in the curriculum it's crazy to think that it was only three or four years ago but like a good chunk of it was dedicated towards like building like an LP pipeline from scratch. Like, oh, mm. this, this, these are all the tokenizers tokenizers you use. This is how you use word to vec all that, right? So there was a lot of steps to actually um, getting to that tinkering phase, but that was something that was really impressive is how easy it is to get through that tinkering. Um, now, of course, they're putting things into production. That's like a kind of a separate, you know, big like discussion, but at least now it's just, it's so much different. And that was kind of that early exposure to that. And of course, like we did have to go through certain steps and we had to figure out how to productionize like those kinds of systems and models safely. And I think we were still trying to figuring out when I left MailChimp. Mm -hmm. Um, But to me, that was like a really kind of interesting step in that direction where it was like, oh, this is a model or this is a set of features that um, very obviously drives value for MailChimp. Uh, because mm-hmm. it's wrapped into this like overall business model of empowering yeah. small medium sized businesses to um, like automate their existing workflows and to augment their existing talent, especially in areas where, um, especially during like the pandemic, especially a lot of businesses just didn't have those resources to, mm-hmm. to devote to like a full time person. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that experience. And uh, so what was the biggest challenge um, in MLOps? Yeah, so the biggest challenge, you know, it's oddly enough, I feel like some of the big challenges haven't really changed as much as they've been like super boosted by the like the mass adoption of like generative AI and LM models. Mm -hmm. Um, So for example, so the three main areas I kind of see people sort of screw up on with ML ops. Uh, The first one is a lot of times. So over in feature form, we've kind of been developing this kind of framework of how to think of a stack because Tons of companies, they publish like their papers or their blog posts on their ML platforms, but the extent of their maturity is really so like disparate. You know, you can have some companies like, so for example, uh, Shopify, they had published uh, some blog posts about their platform, Merlin. Um, And it's just like one of the things, one of the takeaways I got was it was just a, it's a very well abstracted platform. It's kind of what you would expect to see. And I know I was talking with a friend of mine, uh, Matthew Sharp, who um, is an ML. He's either an MLE or or an MLP over there. Um, I forgot what the exact title is, but he works on the platform there. And he was saying that, you know, when they first, when he first started, right, everyone goes through the process of deploying a model from scratch. Uh, 
and it, it probably takes them less than a week, which is like fantastic. Like from, you know, concept ideation to, oh, you actually have a model that you can like ping against an API and you can like serve up like inferences and all that. That's, that's fantastic. A lot of companies, like even their ML platform, their ML platform is more a collection of like tools and like libraries and all this other stuff. So we've been trying to think about framework for like, okay, if you're a startup or you're, you know, a midsize, or even if you're an enterprise and you're a team and you're trying to kind of, you're trying, for example, take Matt Turk's Mad Landscape and really kind of map the tools in there to your kind of specific needs for your roadmap. Um, how would you go about that? And I think where people get stuck on is actually like really, I don't want to say simple stuff, but it's, it's not, it's not big brain stuff. So for example, like treating your platform as a product, uh, that is not a big brain problem, right? Because if you think about it, like product managers have already developed like a set of, uh, tools and ideas and methodologies for how they're able to, for example, you know, ideally work with engineering and devs to take like business requirements and actually translate it into, okay, these are some like actionables that we need to do, right? So I think that's one one area that people really kind of screw up on. Um, I think the second part people kind of really mess up on, and, and this is where I would argue this is one of those that it's not that it's new to like the LM generative AI era, but it's definitely been highlighted is the lack of like product of, of data thinking of like data as a product thinking. And specifically it's this idea that in a lot of companies, right? People are still developing models and they're just like tossing it over the wall. And maybe it's just, maybe it's something that's like not super sophisticated. Like it could just be like a time series model or whatever, right? Um, they might have some initial monitoring on it to see like, okay, like did this like model just fall apart in production? like? Did it stop returning um, predictions or did it stop serving like, you know, inference and all that. Uh, but for other models, for example, where, where you're doing like a recommendation system or for example, a generative AI model where you're suggesting images or you're, for example, like your chat GPT and you're suggesting like responses, uh, you should be really collecting feedback on whether or not those responses First off, like, were they useful to the individual? Um, you know, why weren't they useful to the individual? And so there's a lot of things, these things that like people sh could be doing on the UX, like front end part to actually be collecting this information that they can then use to augment their, uh, you know, training sets and all that good stuff. And even like, for example, for some of the emerging patterns for augmenting LMs, like you're, like companies are really, really going to need that um, because we see this like weird play between oh like like um model driven ai data driven ai and the thing that kind of sticks out to me is just the fact that like we keep ping ping ponging back in between those two kind of perspectives on ai which which says to me that they're basically both important they're both going to keep coming up in the future um and so like instead of just saying oh we're only going to focus on like model centric AI or we're only going to focus on data centric ai People should be really investing in both just to make sure they're getting the most bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. So it's more like getting feedback from the users um, and uh, kind of get additional data and uh, um, thinking about data as, as a product, not just I have the training set, validation set, and then it's fixed. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What about the third one? Yeah, I'd say the third one is, I'm like trigger, I'm trying to figure out a way to like put this. So we talked about how people should be treating their, their ML platform as a product, right? And there's kind of certain mm. um, implications there, which is you really right. should be project and product managing it. Um, the second part is like getting that data, getting that, um, that first party data in there. Like not just understanding, oh, did this break, but also how well is it working and, you know, who is it mm. working for? And I'd say the third one that is really kind of being highlighted, this is something I, I personally have been, you know, I, I've been like thinking about this because 
in the last couple of years, especially, we've been hearing, okay, there should be this consolidation in the market in like the ecosystem and the tooling. Mm -hmm. And also like, even though the tools keep getting simpler and simpler, the roles keep specializing. And in my head, that does not really equate in the sense of if the tools should be easier to use, then you would almost see people's, you would almost see like more generalists as opposed to specialists. Um, and I think that's kind of actually what we're going to be seeing, oddly enough, is I think like, for example, let's, let's just look at the data engineering world, right? They had the first off, mo well, most of the data engineers start off as data scientists. Then you had a group of folks that broke into like data engineers. These are the folks who are like writing like robust and scalable pipelines using like Spark and, um, you know, all sorts of other tools that maybe data scientists weren't necessarily using. And then you have that group, part of them also split out into like analytics engineers, right? I think something that, and this is more on the individual level that people kind of mess up on is thinking that they're too specialized to learn the adjacent areas. So for example, thinking I'm an ML engineer, I don't need to understand, I don't need to learn what's going on in the data engineering world or vice versa. Data engineers going like, well, you know, modeling is really easy. You just toss a bunch of data at it and then you need to just make sure like the like the pipeline can handle like i don't know x like terabytes of data coming through and you're good right and i think there hasn't really been this pollination of like mm -hmm. understanding and knowledge such that you would then have kind of better products and you would also have better collaborations and better um like requirements gathering for the kinds of platforms like people actually need so i think like yeah. that's also like really coming up i'm just seeing that a lot more where we're yeah. seeing people who they have a strong engineering skill set in one area and they're just starting to build projects in other areas so for example mm -hmm. uh hassan over at um yeah hassan over at russell right he goes some folks know him on twitter as like or his hashtag is like nutlope um most people don't even if they don't know him they do know the the room gpt project which was like, which went totally viral. And it's basically you take a photo or video of it, or you take a photo of your like room, right? And then essentially it will redo that room, like using, um, I forgot what what his exact uh, stack was using, but specifically he was showcasing Vercel Edge functions. Vercel is not an ML company um, and he is not an ML engineer, at least by title, but his projects in like working and tinkering with generative AI, like they've just gone absolutely viral. He, they, someone created a filter of it on TikTok, uh, which is how a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the Gen Zers found out about it. Um, he's been interviewed by the folks who made the React documentary. So he's doing all this cool stuff in ML and Gen AI, and he's not a data scientist. He is not a data engineer. He is. I, he either calls himself like a general suite or he's like a front end mobile guy, you know? So to me, that's kind of really fascinating is that you're seeing a lot of folks like really take advantage of these tools that like aren't, we wouldn't consider them traditional like data ML practitioners. So I think there's going to be a lot of that intermingling. And I think the worst thing that an ML engineer or an ML ops engineer or data engineer could do is, is say, Hey, you know, we're just going to stick in our little niche. And it's just like, I don't think people can afford to do that anymore, frankly. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think now, um, basically, you just need to learn whatever you need to do to deliver a product, whether it's software engineer, data engineer, and such. So um, we have, a, a, I think we, we're like halfway in. Maybe let's, let's get into more kind of technical aspect of it. So for especially for large language models um how do you think about the best practices in um you know ml ops for llm that's especially when it's kind of a little bit different from just uh, uh ml ops in general yeah that's a great question so i think the the two or three areas where things get a little bit tricky with LLMs. Um, so the first one is honestly measuring performance 
measuring me- measuring performance and measuring drift, right? So that I don't want to say it's a solved problem in classical machine learning systems, but we have practices for how to do that. I think it gets a little bit trickier with LLMs. So there's been kind of like a few patterns that have been put out there. So one pattern has been, um, so there's a couple things, right? So one thing that lots of folks are talking about, this is around the whole prompt engineering, is um, you got to keep track of your like parameters. It's, it's In that regard, it's very similar to like, more traditional like machine learning or deep learning is you need Mm -hmm. to find a way to like systematically like keep track of your experimentation and your parameters the um the inputs that you're using uh the specific models or apis that you're running like your prompts against uh like keeping track of it such that you can like understand like the tweaks that you're making what's the impact right Mm -hmm. so that's kind of like the first step is even though it can feel like a very creative process and it's a little bit different when you're typically like when people are are training or developing like traditional machine learning models right they might be running multiple in parallel and then they're kind of just like running a ton of different parameters and then they're just trying to figure out what's the optimal like combination it's a little bit harder to do that with um llms but you can still apply some rigor to Mm. like developing stuff there. Yeah. Are there, are there any tools or uh, you recommend for people to do this? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, you know, honestly, like, so, so weights and biases and ML flow, they've been there. There's a few companies that have been pushing out some like really kind of interesting, um, interesting updates, just kind of keep up. So I wouldn't be surprised if they come out with stuff. I know over at FeatureForm, we're also like really thinking about how we can kind of better serve our data scientists. So mm-hmm. at least like, I know that's like top of mind. Um, I think folks who, I would say people should take a look at kind of the the, t- the most, popular, most popular experimentation tracking um, programs that are out there or uh, libraries and I mean, keep an eye out. Also, people can like create issues and like on those open source repos too. So I would also encourage like folks to do that as well. If, there, mm-hmm. if there's like a really popular one that they like using, it's just create an issue. Go, hey, like, are you guys going to support uh, prompts or text? Um, mm-hmm. So that's like one thing that is a little bit different. It's just, it's, it's a little bit harder to do that, right? For prompts. Yeah. Um, I think... The other thing that kind of sticks out, okay, so I also talked about, that was related to the conversation about, or the thought about like drift. How do you, how do you check that, right? Mm. So some of the patterns that have come out include, which I think this is still a maturing space because some of the patterns that people talk about to me just feel like super hacky. And if I was like, for example, back in, into it, I would be like, no, we're not doing this. Um, so one, mm-hmm is for example, taking the same prompt and like running it through different LLMs, both open source and the proprietary ones Mm -hmm. and like scoring the, it's, it's like you, you like take those outputs and I guess like you can sample or score them and then you can compare them against each other. To me, that's like uh, interesting. It's also seems like it's a little bit challenging because you'd have to have like a very specific idea. You'd have to have a very specific idea of what that scoring looks like. Like what what mm-hmm. what does good look like? Um, another pattern that people have been talking about, or another like method that people have been talking about, is um, still like you compare it against like a corpus. So that's where a pattern like like rag. Uh, retrieval augmented can can kind of like help improve with, um, with so for example like ch- like chat GP so GPT four right I think it was only trained up to like two thousand and twenty one I want to say or some of the earlier ones so essentially like any events after that cut off they're not necessarily going to understand and more importantly because they were trained on a general corpus of 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 data they're not really they might not know stuff about your specific product or situation or 
uh, your services or, or whatever, right? And so that's kind of where they can help with that a bit. Um, another thing that's like really different is, so if people use like an LLM API, they're not really going to have control over, like they can't actually fiddle with it. And they, if it's a, if it's a proprietary one that's not open source, they're not also going to have insights into the weights. So I think that's another big challenge that maybe most companies or teams aren't, they're going to have to like adjust to is like, what are the implications for them? If they have like very specific, like data privacy or security issues, um, you know, a, a product like, like GPT-4 might not actually, they might not actually be able to like run with it. You know, so I think that, but I think that is a big difference is you're going to be heavily using like APIs that you might not actually have like insight or access to like under the hood. Um, mm. I think a third one that really kind of sticks out is the implications on potential like infrastructure, right? So specifically for a lot of, for some teams, um, at least in like the initial MVP level, they might not need like a vector database, but once you get beyond like a certain um, volume of, of vectors and queries. So for example, like when you get beyond like 50,000 like vectors, like you might need to really, really start looking at kind of things like vector DBs or um, things like that. So those are some of like the, the big differences, I think from like traditional MOPs that are coming about because of like LLMs, but it's definitely like still, still very, very maturing uh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, then what about tool tools? So think about just maybe say strip away the part where we um, fine tune just on the deployment side, what are the tools people use um, to put large language models in production? Do you feel uh, is different from other kind of ML ops de deployment tools? That's a good question. So so that's the challenge, right? As I, as I don't feel like we've seen a lot, I don't, I feel like a lot of the projects that we've seen do really, really well out there. I don't know if they have quite crossed into like full production support. Mm. So I think I just see a lot of, uh, sorry, I interrupt. Okay. I, I just kind of, uh, I think this point is interesting because you see a lot of new product develop using large language models kind of in demo mode. You see a lot of open yeah. source project, but uh, I don't know how well it will generalize, uh, how well it will, it will scale. Um, maybe let's just talk a lot, talk a little bit about like scaling. So if people are building their first larger language model, they want to put in production, what are some of your advice in, in terms of, you know, scaling, thinking about like latency, cost, inference, et cetera? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great question. So, okay. So the first thing I would say is, uh, you know, okay, if I'm going to separate two use cases, I'm going to separate mm -hmm. student and then there's like kind of the, I don't want to say serious entrepreneur, but someone who's trying to make money off of their project, right? Yeah. So the things that are very similar is um, one, you should tinker, right? So tools like, um, so like, for example, pre-trained models, Hugging Face has a bunch of them. Um, obviously, OpenAI has a bunch, but there are a bunch of like open source uh, LLMs out there, or like even like if you want to go into the computer vision space, right? There are a ton of like open source models out there. So I would say like it doesn't hurt to tinker. Um, something that is a challenge for some open source projects is that not all of them are as permissive in the sense of like just because it's open source doesn't mean you can actually use, use it in a commercial use case but you can use it for tinkering projects right so that's like the thing that is the same for both those groups the you know the person that's trying to get that's trying to do a fun project get their feet wet versus the like solo entrepreneur or whatever right is get your feet wet with using like um an open source tool um 
Langchain has a ton of like pre-built chains that you can kind of use and piggyback off of. So explore there, like have fun with your, your notebooks. Honestly, like this is why notebooks are great. And this is why I think people should not rag on them. Um, you know, so really kind of build out like what's the behavior? How do you want to interact with all the good stuff? Once you get there, toss to find a Streamlit app um, and then, you know, get some more interactivity, get some more, more data around it. Where I think things start to diverge quite a bit is, so if you're like a student, right? Um, usually like having some kind of like building out some kind of chain, uh, creating like a cute app around it, tossing a Streamlit web app on that. And if you need to like, add on additional storage. You could use serverless and all that good stuff. Um, that is going to be sufficient, right? But for the entrepreneur or the person who's like really kind of serious about building this out into like a, like a production use case, um, there's like a couple things that are going to happen. Um, so the first one is, uh, so questions about scaling, right? So So let's say, for example, you're using like OpenAI and you're using the API, right? They are going to have certain limits anyway. So you're just going to have to abide by whatever those limits they are that they set. Most of your scaling is going to come from uh, one, like people like, inter like, let's say, for example, you have like a web app or whatever, right? Most of the scaling issues are going to come from people like interacting with the interface. So, and usually at that point, sometimes serverless is good. You could also do like, you know, use EC2 or what have you. And then if you decide to do any sort of like uh, document storage or uh, retrieval, um, you can use like, you can use document database. You could use uh, a vector like search over like in between it to do that augmentation. Um, so those are the things that are going to be quite different. And also security is a, is a huge, huge aspect, security and cost. Um, because mm -hmm. something that like has been kind of noticeable is when people are like working with these user interfaces, like, especially with the kind of, um, one of the things that people I think really loved about when ChatGPT came out was how seamless and kind of quick it was. So mm -hmm. latency is going to be a huge aspect of that. Right. Yeah. So I think those are the considerations that like an engineer who's building a product that they actually want to sell versus like a student that's building um, like a dem like a demo project. That's where it's going to be like really different is like cost, serving, security, um, additional like data augmentation. And also how do you make sure that, oh yeah, and monitoring too. That's like a big part, right? Making sure you're actually mm -hmm. monitoring like both the uh, application performance, but also you're collecting feedback like from people actually using the app such that you can understand like, first off, like, is it working? Um, but also then you can start, you know, you can start like adding to your own like corpus of data. So for example, if you like, if you're, let's say, um, I'll use like uh, Google or like Autodesk. And mm -hmm. you have people coming to a product forum asking very, very specific questions. Um, on the one hand, they could be asking about, so Autodesk had this product called uh, uh, Fusion 360, right? So they could be asking about like Fusion as in like some other kind of chemical processor, or they could be asking about Fusion as the product. And maybe they have very specific questions about like support, et cetera. Like, you can essentially start adding those questions in and you could do some kind of like question answering similarity. That's just like much faster. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, th I think those, those are some like major differences that just aren't always like obvious when you're doing these like demo projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and in terms of, uh, tools or are there any say open source package or some tools you feel that can help people with, the uh, um, those issues you you talked about, for example, scaling, um, latency, uh, especially um, security. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so 
so in, okay so in general for 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 serving right i think I don't think cloud well, is or maybe there's not like it doesn't have to be a tool or just in general what would you feel people from like a builder perspective they can they can uh, adopt some some processes or um to kind of yeah yeah i mean in terms of monitoring um there's tools like y labs there's gantry there's a few others um in terms of serving um there's like a few tools out there uh for example like bento ml is uh and bento ml and they have a tool called yatai is it is great for um uh deploying like ml models um zen ml is like an integration framework that like connects a bunch of these tools together so that's something that people could take a look at um experimentation experimentation tracking i've already talked about um weights and biases and uh, MLflow has a couple things going on. Uh, Weaviate for like a vector search database is an option. Um, what are some other ones that people could check out? Do, 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 do. I already mentioned Hugging Face has a bunch of like pre-trained models. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's a bunch. Something, something else too that people could take a look at, or could people could keep an eye out on, is like the trending repos on GitHub. That's also not a not a bad place. Uh, like looking at like the trending like, like oh, trending repos, repos on GitHub. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not a bad place to look either. Um, it's mm -hmm. been pretty surprising actually. There have been tools that I've seen on there that are like well starred, and they're not, mm -hmm. for example, on like the Mad Turk landscape. Mm -hmm. It seems to be like. It seems like the place to go when you're thinking of or when you're trying to like stay in the loop for like what's mm. going on in like the tooling space for LMs seems to be a combination yeah. of like Twitter, Twitter, GitHub, and Discord. <laughs> seems to be a place yeah. where everyone's having the conversations. Yeah. Um, and uh, before we go to like a quick demo and QA, um, Oh my gosh, I forgot what I was going to ask. Yeah. Oh, I, I think that, yeah, I think I want to ask you if I am exploring a new use case for my company and it's related to, related to LLM, it's going to be the first thing I will put in production, mm -hmm. you know, for my company, for my team. What is some of your um, advice? Yeah. Okay. So you're a data scientist or an MLE or, or whoever, and you mm -hmm. want to build like the first like uh, LM model for your company's case. So many of the steps are not going to be totally different from like building. Um, uh, ooh, those are some good options in the chat. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So Okay, so what's what's not going to change from like trying to pitch a, a like traditional ML, right? Because in many ways we're at, we're at the beginning of like the AI hype where people had to like sort of get buy in on models. I think the first the first thing is is tinkering, just building an MVP. Um, once again, like you could look at Langchain for that, um, and you don't have to use a like, company data. You can there's plenty of like public data sets out there, both on like Kaggle, uh, but but there's a ton of others. Um, for example, if you're using a recommender for image, like there's a bunch of like fashion data sets here and all that good stuff. Um, so that's the first thing is like build that, like build a tiny MVP and toss a Streamlit app on it. Then I think the second part is at the end of the day, companies kind of want to make money. So you need to like really kind of like really position how your project is essentially going to like drive like certain business goals, right? So the, mm -hmm. those two things are not super different. The, the main difference is it's a lot easier to now build that MVP for sure. Because yeah. uh, for example, like a lot of times, if you want to do something, you can look at Langchain and see that someone's already built like some kind of chain. Um, the third thing also is I know a lot of engineers, data scientists absolutely hate like project product managers, but they, they really should. So a resource that I really love or a place where I go to take courses and workshops is uh, Reforge. 
uh reforge has some amazing master classes on like growth on product management on user adoption um yeah engineers should really kind of get on the same page with like what some of those disciplines that have been developed in the pm world of like mm -hmm. how do you get some initial users um how do you take surveys get qualitative you know like not not just quantitative like data of like how fast it's taking them to develop malls but like qualitative mm -hmm. like, what are the steps they're running into what are the things that are being automated um mm -hmm. And then collect that into a compelling business story because i think that's like the that's like the weird secret or, that like people don't really talk about is a lot of times um a lot of times people will there's two routes for how people can get projects into a company or um mm -hmm. to get like business buy-in right the first way is kind of like the shadow it way where you do a project that's like off cycle you build it all on your own on your weekends and your in your night and then you get you get like a super slick MVP, and then you show it at like a hack uh, at like a town hall or the team meeting or whatever, and then people experience FOMO and they're like, oh, we should go support this, da da da, right? So that's one way. Other people can, some people can make it through the official channels, and the way they do that is just getting like a lot of early buy-in and like feedback, and I think with, I think the. The one thing that people kind of need to sort of be aware of, especially if they're building a project for the first time around Generative AI, is how polarizing the opinions are around that space. Like, I, you can't just go into it going like, guys, this is super exciting. I really love it. It's going to be really great for my resume. Like, mm. that is not the way to go. The way to go yeah. is to, like, really break down what is the business use case? What are the KPIs that we're trying to drive? Also, like, help front load all the information that people would need to understand and mm. what are the implications uh for example i'm like okay if uh like how does this actually work like what's the difference between like fine tuning versus um uh you know like loading stuff into the context window like all that other stuff like like help your business partners really understand uh what's going on and mm -hmm. then uh yeah and then and then like stick to the path right yeah like, that's the important part Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, I see a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, before we get to that, I saw someone was asking some project templates from Predibase. Uh, we have actually have our um, ML engineers here. Uh, he's going to give a quick demo on how do you fine tune and deploy a large language models in uh, Predibase. Anav, do you want to um, join the stage and give us a quick demo. Yeah, absolutely. You can guys yeah. hear me OK? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, happy to happy to dive in. Just before I dive in, I know the question was on feature form plus database. I don't think that exists today, but it's definitely something we can we can find create together. Um, so definitely keep a lookout for that. Cool. So um, hey, everyone, I'm Arnav. I'm a machine learning engineer at Predibase, um, and I'll do a quick um, demo on how easy it is to fine tune your large language model in Predibase, um, as well as Ludwig, which is our open source project that Predibase is built on top of. Um, and so for, for today's um, demo, we're going to be um, fine tuning Llama, which is Llama using the Alpaca data set. Um, and I'll give you some context on what these are super quick. So Essentially, um, you know, let me maybe go full screen. Maybe this is better. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Llama, it is essentially um, a collection of foundation LLMs that Meta AI released um, in Feb this year. And um, they sort of come in a variety of sizes from 7 billion parameters to 65 billion parameters. Uh, and so that makes them significantly smaller than models like ChatGPT, which are, you know, in the 175 billion or 200, 300 billion parameter range. But what's really cool about the Llama models and Llama architecture is that um, in terms of performance, they're very close to sort of like the chat GPT style of models, uh, which is pretty cool. So this is, what, this is a base model that we'll be using for fine tuning. Um, and then the data set we'll be using is the Alpaca data set released by Stanford. Uh, what this is is essentially, you know, 52,000 instruction response pairs. Um, so instruction goes as input and we get an output response. So we're going to do text generation. 
Um, and for those of you who may not be familiar with what instruction tuning is, it essentially is a form of fine tuning where you're helping the model perform tasks that the model wasn't originally trained on, such as sentiment analysis, maybe question answering, rule-based tasks, providing recommendations, things like that. And it's, in some ways, like you're giving them the base model, like the Llama models, chat GPT style capabilities. Um, it's obviously a little bit of an oversimplification, but that's the idea that we're going for. So just to give you a little bit of an insight into what the data set looks like, um, you have two sort of types of rows you have, or, or sort of types of data points in this data set. There's the ones which have an instruction followed by a response. Um, and then there's some which need more context. Um, so it could have an instruction followed by context, followed by response. Um, and in real practice, you pro there's probably like both types of queries you can imagine. You can ask ChatGPT, if you think about ChatGPT, to explain like, what is machine learning? That would be this sort of instruction and, and then it would give generate a response. And um, an example of this sort of instruction format is summarize the following paragraph and you give it the paragraph as the input and then it produces an output. So we're basically trying to replicate that in a nutshell. So with that context, uh, we can dive into the Pratibase product. Um, and so there's a lot that you can do, but we'll focus on just building model versions today. Um, and, and this sort of screen that you see is what we call model repositories, where you can organize um, your model machine learning experiments and compare different model version jobs, uh, sort of track metrics over time. So it's a nice organization of things. And once you're inside your model repository, uh, you can click on, you know, create a new model, a new model version from data for me. What that does is it takes you into our model version screen. So here you can explore some suggested base models if you'd like for your task or build a custom model, which is what we'll do today. Um, you can type in a description, um, connect your data set. So what I did in advance is I actually merged the input column to the instruction column to create like just two columns, an instruction plus input column and an output column. And so, and then I uploaded that data set to Predibase. Um, you can all, and then the next thing you do is select your target output feature. So in our case, there's input instruction and output in our data set. Um, and the one we want to predict is the output. So that's what we said. Predibase supports a variety of model types, such as neural networks, gradient boosted trees, and also this new model type called large language models. Um, and you can do two things with it. Either do zero shot or few shot prompting on like your entire data set or you can use this to fine tune the model to your data set. So that's just what we'll be doing today. Um, and the next thing you can do is hit next. So this takes you to sort of like screen two of our model builder flow. And the first thing you see is that Predibase infers the entire sort of pipe training pipelines end to end uh, in this butterfly diagram. So you have your instruction, which is a feature that we have as input, which gets pre-processed, um, passed into the LLM, and then, you know, sort of that response that's produced by the LLM is decoded, and then we perform some post-processing, and you get your prediction. Um, and although this, we're showing this for LLMs, technically you can do this for multimodality um, for other model types like neural networks. Uh, but the, the real question is, how do I actually configure this pipeline? And what's cool about Predibase is that you can control what you want and sort of leave the rest to us to essentially default to reasonable values. Um, so if you want to fine tune the Llama model, as I, as I did earlier um, last week, um, you type in a model name. We preloaded a bunch of uh, LLMs from really small sort of base models for sanity checking, like Facebook OPT 350 million, all the way up to like 13 billion parameter models. Um, and although we've preloaded a few options, uh, there's also a way to provide any open source model from Hugging Face. So you can actually fine tune any model of your choice, um, as long as it's yeah, on hugging face at the moment. Um, so that's the first thing you'd want to do. Um, the second thing is that since we are fine tuning, you want to actually configure, we essentially support two types of trainers, none, which just means that zero shot or few shot and then fine tune. Um, and then there's a couple of usual things we'd want to play around with. I heard Mikiko talking about prompts and prompt templates and you know, sort of that, that pre-processing flow. And what's usually a really good idea for fine tuning, especially instruction tuning, is transforming your input data. Um, so something that we saw here into something that's more instructive for the model. Um, and so what you can do in Predibase is define your task, which is sort of what you want the model to do, and then a template, which is how you want the data to look after processing. Um, 
And to give you an example of what this really looks like, um, so this is the same example that we saw earlier. You know, this is the input. Um, and then I define this task and template in Predibase. And what this does is essentially transforms all of this into this. So below is an instruction that describes a task, write a response that appropriately completes the request. Um, you sort of type, you know, inserts your sort of input row as the instruction, and then we add response and we say, okay, at my LLM, can you please generate a response from this point on? Um, and so you can control this completely to your liking. This is just what I thought worked really well for the Llama model and what was suggested in the base paper. Um, you can also control generation related parameters, which is how many tokens to produce, what temperature to set, um, which sort of decides how creative you want your model to be. Um, and we have these as advanced parameters, but we support the entire range of generation parameters that Hugging Face supports. And finally, what you can do is specify your adapter options. So uh, uh, when, you come to, when it comes to fine tuning, there's sort of two large, uh, two different approaches you can take. You can either adjust all the weights in your model where you do full fine tuning, or you can actually just insert a few layers and adjust those parameters. Um, and so usually that second class of fine tuning is called parameter efficient fine tuning or PEFT. Um, and so usually that's actually a very good idea for, for these large language models because they're in the billions of parameters, which means training is slow and you know adjusting the weights might actually force, might make it forget what it was already trained on, which we never want. So in our case, uh, for like the Llama model with Alpaca, we're gonna use something called the LoRa adapter. Um, and the cool thing about parameter efficient fine tuning is that you essentially end up tuning like 0.5% of like the total number of parameters in your LLM. So it's very efficient and very fast. Um, and you can do it on very few GPUs if you'd like. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's how it works. And as, it's as simple as that. So at this point, we've defined what model we want, how, what kind of prompt and template we want, how we want, it, how we want the model to generate tokens, and whether we want to do full fine tuning of all the weights or just you know uh, a small set of weights and doing it in a parameter efficient style, and then we just hit train and you start model and you start your model training. Um, I won't do that today because we're you know in this demo. But um, the last thing I'll show you is that I did actually fine tune the model in advance, um, and so you know you can train it for a certain number of epochs. We actually produce you know all of these sort of learning curves. Oh. Yeah, these learning curves, um, you know, in my case, my model overfit, but actually it turns out that's not such a bad thing for fine tuning. Um, and we also have this underlying Ludwig config, which is a summary of all the parameters that I just described to you, but sort of in YAML form. And so if you use our open source Ludwig, um, you know, you can actually do this by yourself with your own hardware, um, where Predibase actually manages all the infra for you. Um, so with that, I'll I'll pause um, and hand it back to you. I'll have a question, Anar. Thanks for giving yeah. the the demo. Uh, so this one, I I saw you enter like the the prompt. Um, what is the data set are you training? Is this just you know one shot or um, did you upload your? What if I want to train on my custom data set? Yeah, absolutely. So in Predibase, we actually support a variety of data set types. So there's, you know, your own file. You, if you have a Snowflake or S3, Azure Data Lake Query, we support basically a variety of ways of ingesting your data. And so no matter where your data lives, we should be able to ingest it. And then you can use that for downstream tasks, uh, such as fine tuning. In my case, um, since Alpaca is a research data set, I had to download it manually and then upload it as a file into Predibase. Cool. Thanks, Anarv. Uh, so there's a button here if you're interested in try that. Actually, we have our product launch today. Uh, you can request a free um, access and try the uh, platform uh, for free, I think, uh, for, for a few days or a few weeks. So, all right, let's come back to questions for Mikiko. Um, let's see. I think someone was asking, I think Anarv mentioned uh, uh, some tools for data quality monitoring. Are there any tools you use um, for data quality monitoring? So for data quality monitoring, um, 
Yeah, I've used by DQ. I'm oh, sorry, is this for me, Kiko? Uh, uh, I guess uh, you, I was you, should, you should go ahead and answer, actually, Arnav, because the last two questions oh, are, because yeah, the I last bad. two questions for you are, are actually in the chat are actually for you based off the demo. Okay, yeah, uh, I can, I, yeah, I mentioned PyDQ and um, create expectations, but I'd love to hear from Mikiko. I think those are great. I think uh, the other one I've heard around is like deep checks is another one. I mm. also heard of one uh, called a Galileo. Um, yeah, Galileo. Yeah. Um, there's another one uh, called OpenLayer. Um, so they do kind of data quality check for machine learning models. They also help you, um, I think, especially with Galileo, you can, uh, they help you with error analysis. They, they, they do look at segments of the data and tell you, uh, you know, whether the model has a kind of balanced impact on all the subgroups. So you can deep dive because at the end of the day, it's always with the, with the data. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah, do you want to, yeah, in, go in all, And all enough, I think this is like, I think data quality for ML is like this weird intersection of different domains and different kind of perspectives. Because for example, like Chad Sanderson has his concept of the data contracts, which is essentially, I, people can kind of look it up and there's a much better explanation of it. But the idea is like, if you essentially enforce like schema, like, like schema um, structure and validation, then hypothetically, at least like from a structure and data types perspective, like you, that should decrease your like data quality issues. But at the same time, I'm like, there aren't really a lot of the tools that you would use for like tabular structured numeric data are just really not sufficient for like texts or prompts or um, even embeddings. And so it's like a little bit of this weird space where it's like, yeah, we know that we're going to be used, like we know that data essentially gets ported eventually for like ML use cases. And in the case of like any like NLP or LLM models, it's going to essentially either be turned into embeddings or what have, or it might maybe stay in the prompt stage, but a lot of tools are used for, I think that were used for like data monitoring and data quality checks for even for like a lot of that tabular data, I, I don't think is really sufficient. I feel like the people who honestly are going to be best positioned to like extend their existing use cases are probably like folks that were essentially developing data quality tools for like deep learning models or for embeddings which will be like really kind of interesting I think we're all muted. Yeah, that was weird. We all. Oh, I was muted. muted. I was muted. Sorry. Yeah. I was <laughs> like, are you guys muted? <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask Arnav, uh, can you, can Predators be distributed with my software? Uh, Indra Neil's question uh, Would you use File Connector to create your own Copilot clone? Yeah, um, so to answer the first question, yes, it can be distributed. Um, rather than using SaaS, uh, if I understand that correctly, we do support like a VPC style deployment as well, where so our database lives in, in your own uh, VPC network. And so, you know, you can manage your own compute and things like that. And then data never leaves sort of your, your, your cloud. Um, so yes, and I think uh, if, if, your, if your question was in terms of like, can it be tied into your software? I think that's a discussion we can definitely like have as well, I would recommend reaching out to, you know, Daliana or um, you know, um, David uh, after the call, and I can I can set that up for you. Uh, would you use the file connector to create your own Copilot clone? Uh, probably not. Usually, for something like a Copilot clone and and good effective fine tuning, I've noticed that you need larger data sets, um, because a lot of the base models usually attend then uh, uh, trained on you know general text, as Mikiko was like talking about earlier. 
And so if you want to create the smallest distribution, not scale up, uh, maybe file uploads are fine, but if you really want something that works very well, I'd say you probably want to have your data in some sort of external storage like S3, and then that, that's what you pull in. Um, just more efficient, but really, you know, file upload and data upload is a one-time cost that you have to pay. Cool. Uh, let's see, what are some other questions? Uh, what are some open source serving options for ML models? Miki, do you want to take this one? Ye yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, well, so for one thing, there are a number of ways people can serve models. Uh, so the four main ones, right, are you could always do like a bat, assuming we're speaking in like the entire realm of machine learning and not just like LLMs, right? But there are like three or four predominant patterns, right? One of them is uh, uh, batch computed, uh, pre-computed. So that's always easy simple and there are just so many tools you can use there you just need to have some kind of like um a database that supports uh you know like high like reads uh it doesn't even need to like have like great writes especially if you're doing it for example on like a weekly or daily cadence it's fine and there are a ton of like databases out there that are great for that um i know at least like over at mailchimp we used we use spanner but you don't have to go to the big dogs so you could just use some smaller stuff out there um and then you can plop like a fast api api like on top of it uh second pattern is like a live service uh so essentially you have a pre-trained model uh you can containerize it and then you know you can serve predictions out that way and then essentially like if you use some kind of like serverless or some kind of like hosted uh like kubernetes engine or what have you ton of options there uh and then like the other three are what is it no then there's embedded um which a lot of people don't use necessarily unless they really want to like uh but yeah so in terms of like those like two options right pre-computed live service um I'd already mentioned a few like open source ones, like uh, Bento ML and Yatai. Um, there have also people have been using Modal a lot, uh, Banana for like serverless GPUs. Um, to be honest, like in terms of, I think sometimes a lot of times people buy more compute than they actually need, or like buy like really heavy into like uh, some like the big expensive options. I would say take a look at some of like Modal uh banana.dev uh things like that for like scaling up your projects and then in terms of actually serving try to go with like really simple patterns where it's like you could just literally like plop a container behind an api endpoint and even then like there's a ton of platforms that will just like easily support that as long as you just like push a container out there cool um what else let's see Have you, have we addressed David's question? Uh, David was asking Narva, can you show the trained model working with the test prom end question? Yeah, absolutely. So I, just because, you know, um, we're, we're over time, I didn't want to actually show that part, but we actually do have sort of like a, a query editor within Predibase, where you, or sort of like a playground, if you will, where you can try different open source models. And also in our case, we did deploy our own fine tuned LLM that I showed you. Um, I sent a link to a YouTube video from a webinar we hosted, I think last week, um, where we actually went to the same demo, but in like much longer and deeper length. And I actually show in that demo sort of the before and after of instruction tuning. So um, I sent a link in the chat. I would highly recommend just skipping to like maybe 40 minutes in and watching from there. Um, and so hopefully that will, that will show you what it looks like before and after. Cool. And uh, uh, Pablo asked, how can we decide between using open source LLM or API model that the open source LLM enables more flexibility, worth to try it? Mikiko, do you want to take this one? Yeah, totally. And I think Arnav had, he just had a very fantastic rundown of basically what I was going to say anyway um, in the chat. But 
So it comes down to like three things. Um, first off, honestly, it's like it goes back to that permissiveness, i.e., uh, a lot of times with like with all the proprietary models right now that are closed source, they at least have some kind of terms for how to develop commercial products out of them. With that being said, they're also expensive. <laughs> So um, that's the second consideration is cost. If you're if you're doing this as like uh, there's two ways for, to approach it. If you're doing it as a as a demo or an MVP project, I wouldn't worry about cost so much. Um, you know, with that being said, you could also use that to make the argument that open source is like better in that regard because it is basically free. You just have to like pay for compute someplace. Um, uh, or like it's not free, but it's like you can use it, right? But even within open source, like there is some kind of, like not all permissions are the same, right? Some will allow you to use it as commercial offering. Some of them say, hey, you can use it, but only as like a hobby project. Um, the other aspect as well to consider is um, is data privacy. So for example, the reason why you're probably not going to be seeing a lot of banks really buy into like using um using lms is if they have to like essentially like de-platform data that's the big thing like there are a lot of institutions that either because of like hipaa or um because of like federal regulation they will not be able to they can't de-platform their data right so that's like a big um feature of feature form is we don't de-platform your data we only store your metadata and even then we only store it on your infrastructure but for a lot of folks, that is a consideration. And fourth is also comes down to always like the level of granularity. So teams using pre-trained models, this is not a new thing, right? So I would say like, honestly, like 80 to 90% of the models and pipelines we were in systems we were developing at MailChimp, um, if there was any hint of deep learning involved, it was, they were almost always using a pre-trained model. Could have been through hugging face, could have been um, using like, some of the ones available from PyTorch, you name it. So yeah, I mean, I think, and some people are, are good with that. Um, and then, you know, they use a pre-trained model, they fine tune it on some additional data um, to make it like a bit more useful, but it really just depends on that level of granularity. I do think there, you have to look at that trade-off between moving fast and kind of dirty versus like creating a, a quality product, but it'll take longer. And one of the best ways you can do that is building like iterations in as opposed to like doing this big waterfall of like, you know, build, build, build. And then four months later, you have this amazing grand product that no one really likes to use. So those are some like considerations. Got it. Thanks. Um, I think maybe the last question um, someone was asking, which ML you know, machine learning, deep learning model suites is best suited for classification problem for unbalanced data set. Anyone want to take this? Uh, I don't, I don't feel there's a specific uh, tool that's for unbalanced classification data set, but kind of curious what, what do you think? Uh, honestly, how unbalanced is unbalanced? uh my first question <laughs> secondly uh okay so that's all okay that's another that brings up another good point about uh not just lms but uh deep learning models so the other reason why you might so what another reason why you might see companies use more classical machine learning moving forward and not jumping immediately to lms or any kind of generative ai model is if they mm -hmm. need interpretability and so what do we mean by that? Let's just, you know, frame it up as a, you're uh, a bank or you're an insurance lender or whatever, right? Um, okay, so email marketing, right? If something is marked as spam, that's not, it sucks, but guess what? People can always retrieve it. It really, there's no cost. Uh, if you reject someone's loan based off of certain criteria, you really need to like, you need to understand first off, or Here's a, a less uh, inflammatory example, right? Okay, uh, health data, right? So when I was at when I was a data scientist at Teldoc Livongo, we specialized on digital health data for people with chronic conditions, so diabetes, uh, heart disease, like you you name it, right? 
So we would yeah. send push notifications if we saw that someone's A1C levels based off the blood test they would do to check their glucose levels was too high. We would send a notification saying, hey, we think this is high and you might need to see our nurse or we need to get in contact with you to make sure you're not going into shock or some other, um, you know, you're not like going into like some kind of like suffering from uh, from like Belvade level, right? Um, <sighs> On the one hand, we have the signal data, so we can kind of say like, hey, like, you know, we plot these trends and all that. Let's say, for example, there is like other information. Um, we we would want to understand like what features are going into that determination that, hey, like this person is like going through an acute like situation right now, right? And more importantly, we need to be able to look back and say like, okay, if we did not catch something that someone was going through, we need to be able to understand like, why that happened. So there's a lot of times where you're going to need that feature specific level interpretability, uh, not just for like, um, you know, understanding what happened, but to also like improve your models going forward. Right. So that is one reason why you might not people see people like make the immediate jump um, to deep learning models or even to like LMs or Gen AI models. And why you'll still see a lot of folks using classical machine learning. Um, with that being said, right, like, yeah, like unbalanced, like you have to like we need to understand like how unbalanced is unbalanced. Some people think that like one out of every five is unbalanced. And other people think like one out of every 1000 is like unbalanced. Uh, so we just have to like understand that. But th there are there are techniques, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, okay. I know there's like, a, uh, we, we're already over time, but I think maybe the last last question uh that's addressed that i think this is a good one um where is the question oh someone was asking okay uh momel is asking do you recommend a good roadmap for learning about llms for beginners uh, i think maybe both of you can chime in who wants to go first and now all right, uh, I'll go first. Uh, give me a second to think about it. So, I think I think it depends a lot on what your experience is with machine learning first, and then also with your understanding of natural language and natural language modeling and generation and sort of these like these type of, these types of tasks. So, if you have no background at all with any of that, then that's the first place to start, in my opinion, right? You know, understanding what we're fundamentally doing with machine learning, which uh, I assume everyone here is fairly aware, and then how natural language tasks work, both, you know, general like classification tasks with text data, and then also sort of in this like generation, um, sort of so, sort of like scope of things, because it's been happening for many years. It's just that it's become all the rage in the last year, really. Um, and then in terms of like a roadmap for LLMs, I think, I think I'm having a hard time thinking about the best place to start. Um, but I think the first thing you want to do is actually just play around with LLMs just to understand what they can and can't do. I think that's like a great learning experience in itself. And pretty much what I did first when I was trying to figure out what LLMs actually are. Um, and I think a good way is to actually I say this pretty, I always tell people this for any any machine learning thing, and I, I Mikika will definitely have much better advice than me here, but I always say pick a problem and try and solve it. Um, and so you pick a, a task such as the one I showed you, or maybe something else that you'd like to do and actually go through the motion. So you see what, what you realize is, oh, these models don't do very well, kind of out of the box for your task, um, right? And so you might try prompting your model to see if it can produce some response. You might play around with those prompts, which is a great way of learning about like, the prompting sort of strategy of large language models. Um, and then, you know, dive into more complex prompts. And I, I think uh, Mikiko was talking about like retrieval augmented in context learning and things like that. So, you know, adding examples to your prompt to help give it more context to get, you know, responses. And then you realize, oh, okay, maybe I need to do something more. It's still not doing well, um, and and sort of going through that. Uh, I know I, I was wondering if the expected response here was more on like here, are like three tutorials and three like reading links that you might be able to go to. I I can't think of any at the top of my head, but I think the best way to just learn is to do 
Um, and that's what yeah, I would recommend. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great advice. And then there are like a lot of tutorials out there. Some are good, some are bad. I think you just need to kind of maybe start with, it could be a YouTube video, someone explain things on a high level and then like go read a paper. And then when you actually do it, you know which part you need to like, uh, kind of learn more. Uh, I guess before we get to Miki, Mikiko's answer, uh, I don't know if you tried to do some fine tuning or tried it on your, say a Google Colab notebook, say if I don't have my, you know, GPU, I just want to try it on, on my own. Um, do you think people can just try it on your own, their own laptops compute or use like, I, did, I know in Colab you can access to like GPUs. I can quickly yeah. onto that. So the cool thing with Colab is that they actually do give you a Tesla D4, which is like about 16 gigs of GPU RAM. And that's actually pretty good for smaller models. Uh, and I think if you just want to get a flavor of how like the, these large language models sort of work, it's a great way to, to get started. Um, yeah. And I think yeah, using sort of like the notebook style of development where you play around is probably the yeah, way to go. Cool. Uh, Mikiko, what do you think? So I have a little yeah, bit, yeah. I have a little <laughs> bit of a cheat code about this because I actually posted a LinkedIn post that had like six or seven resources people could use uh, last week. Um, but I, yeah, so hundred like you know plus plus a thousand to everything or not said. Um, I think so. That this is the principle that like so fat uh uh. Fast AI, right? They had their uh, deep learning for practical deep learning for coders course that they uh, had. And that was like the principle that they laid out was like, hey, sometimes you, a lot of times there is, um, when building roadmaps, people kind of like to like toss you through a bunch of theory before you, you get any place. And that is just not how people actually work. Most people like to play and build. And so that's like a great way to start. And then making sure that you're supplementing your learning with um like great resources that can balance both like you know enough technical detail that you're not like steered wrong but at the same time with great storytelling so i would say there okay so for lm specific stuff uh full stack deep learnings lm bootcamp someone asked uh for more details about rag they have an entire like chapter or section of that that videos are now free videos are free now um on augmenting language models. So I would check out uh, full stack deep learning. Um, then for the other stuff that is LLM specific, uh, Cohere had a, had a pretty nice one actually on um, NLP and ML fundamentals, but also on like uh, prompt stuff. So I thought that was really good. Um, the other one that I would recommend, I'm also just copy pasting it into the chat. Uh, oh, the ML Ops community had an LMs and production virtual conference. So 10 plus talks, that was really great. So that is if y'all are already kind of familiar and all good with like your NLP fundamentals. Uh, with that being said, if you are not, the next three I would recommend, and there's no particular order. I think the LLM like in production conference from ML Ops could be a fun one for people to just listen to in the background. You don't have to take notes on it. Just do a pass through and I don't know, and then go work on other stuff. But the other three that I would recommend are that are more on like NLP deep learning fundamentals. Uh, Hugging Face has an NLP course using a transformer, fine tuning a pre-trained model, all that good stuff. Fast AI released a second part of their practical deep learning for coders, uh, which also covers Hugging Face stuff, but they also expand out a bit more. And then Deep Learning Fundamentals by uh, Sebastian Roshka uh, is also a great one. So those are like the six I would recommend. Uh, but I think also if folks just like speed listen through a lot of that and then like a water wheel, you just, you know, you rotate a few times, you get more details each time, then that would be uh, a really good way to go. And then for more like traditional feature engineering, because we still think classical like machine learning is gonna it's gonna be around. It's not going away. Like the feature form perspective is look, there's gonna be three types of features in the world, which is traditional features, embeddings, and then prompts. So for traditional features, uh, we have a part one guide that's on our website that people should check out. Awesome. 
Cool. Uh, so if you are uh, interested in, again, um, get a free demo from Party Base, you can sign up here. And uh, Mikiko, for folks who want to follow you and see what you're up to and then um, maybe try out feature form and some of the content, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, folks can, can find me at on LinkedIn. Uh, it's my name, Mikiko Baisley. Uh, if you follow, uh, if you also follow Dalian on LinkedIn, uh, she tagged me in one or two of the posts. Uh, if you're like, this picture is not a real picture, it's an avatar, then that is in fact my profile. I do not have my real picture on my LinkedIn profile. It is an avatar wearing rainbow shade sunglasses because I do own that pair in real life. Uh, mm -hmm. So follow me there, reach out. Feature Forum has an open source repo um, and we also have a Slack community. So uh, yeah, so check out the repo uh, if you need to, or if you like to, I encourage you pip install Feature Forum. You can do it through a collab notebook, check it out. And uh, yeah, and we have a new release coming out on uh, June 9th with Vector DB support is the big one. So that is a big thing. We'll be supporting the new wave of LLM ops hashtag. Great. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Mikiko, and thanks for uh, giving the demo, Arnav. And uh, we're going to uh, continue to do this type of ML Real Talk and uh, follow me, follow PrediBase LinkedIn account. And uh, thank you all for joining. I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.